Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's MOS Live, where we're going to be taking a look at the sky tonight with our virtual planetarium and one of our museum educators. My name is Katie, my pronouns are she, hers, and I'm going to be your moderator today, checking for any questions or comments that you have in the Q&A on Zoom. So at the bottom of this page, you should see a button that says Q&A. Feel free to type in your questions there. If you're watching from Facebook or YouTube, thank you so much for joining us, but unfortunately we cannot see your questions or comments today. So at this point, oh, sorry, one last thing. Uh, if you'd like to see closed captioning, you can also find that button at the bottom of the screen. And now I'd like to invite our educator to come on and introduce themselves. Hi everybody, my name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm going to be talking to you about a few interesting things that's going on space-wise. Um, and to do that, I am going to uh, use a couple of programs today, actually, starting with one called Stellarium, which is a free open source program um, that you can download yourself. And sort of a, a little twist, I'm not actually going to, I don't actually have it set uh, for tonight. Uh, if you sort of look at the date I have down here, I actually have it set for Monday. And that's because there's a couple of interesting things going on on Monday. First of all, it is the winter solstice. That means it is the first day of winter for here in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, that means it is the shortest day of the year. It is the day that where we get the shortest amount of daylight, just a little over nine hours of daylight here at Boston's latitude. Uh, the further north you go, the less daylight you get. So I actually have this set right now for uh, right around sunrise. Sunrise is going to be at around 7, 10 a.m. I've got this set for a couple of minutes after that. Uh, the sun will be rising as far south of east as it ever gets. So we always say, you know, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. It actually only rises uh, in the east, actually perfectly in the east, uh, twice a year. So um, for the fall and winter, it is always going to be rising somewhere south of east. And the farthest south of east that it gets is on the 21st this year on the first day of winter. And you can see how it's pretty close to the southeast is by zoom in, you can see exactly where on the horizon the sun uh, is coming up. So this is as far south that the sun is going to rise on the horizon. And as I fast forward time, because the really cool thing about Solarium is that you can control time. That's actually only one of the cool things about this program. Um, we can run it through actually to, we'll go ahead and run it to the middle of the day. So when the sun is at its highest above the horizon, which um, always occurs in the middle of the day. And you can see, and for here in Boston, it's always gonna be somewhere in the Southern sky uh, in the middle of the day. It doesn't ever get right above us here in Boston. We're too far North. So it always is somewhere in the Southern sky. And this is, this is it. This is as high as it's gonna get in the sky, which is not very high at all. So just as a, for sort of a comparison, I'm gonna jump time a little bit to six months into the future, the summer solstice so that you can uh, see how far, how big a difference it is. That's gonna be right around June 21st and you can see how high the sun is gonna get above the horizon on that date. It's actually, I have to zoom out in order to be able to see it. It's so far above the horizon. That is one of the reasons summer is so much warmer than winter. So back to Monday, December 21st when the sun is not going to be rising very high above the horizon at all. And if we fast forward time to sunset, you'll be able to see it is also setting very south of west and it's setting quite early, uh, right around 4.15. So the shortest day of the year does not actually mean the earliest sunset. We actually have already passed the day of earliest sunset. So you can see where it's going to be setting very close to southwest. Um, the er, day of earliest sunset was actually last week. What the solstice is, is shortest total amount of daylight. So the time between sunrise and sunset is as short as it's going to get. It's a little over nine hours of daylight for us uh, here in Boston. So late sunrise, sun's not going to get very high in the sky. 
and we have an early sunset. And this marks for uh, the Northern Hemisphere the first day of winter. And just to give us a little bit of an idea of why this looks the way it is, I'm going to use a different program uh, for the moment. I'm going to jump to a program called Worldwide Telescope. This is another free open source program. And what it, this is gonna let us do is actually look at the view from space to see what's happening. In fact, here's sort of what we are seeing in Solarium is what you might call an Earth's eye view or a Boston eye view. We're gonna switch to a sun's eye view, so. Here is Worldwide Telescope. It is a really great program for exploring the solar system. And we are looking at the Earth. And this is the Earth, the way it looks from the sun's perspective on December 21st. So you can see, you can't see the North Pole at all. And I'll go ahead and fast forward time a bit so that we can watch the Earth spin. And as we do, I want you to go ahead and make some observations for me. What parts of the earth are we seeing really well? What parts of the earth are we not seeing really well? Any other observations you wanna make? You can go ahead and put those in the Q&A as we watch the earth turn, as the world turns. All right. Katie, do we have any sorts of observations coming in? Let's see. We have uh, lots of observations about what we're seeing on the Earth. So going around Australia to Africa. Um, are we hovering around the equator? Uh, so what we're seeing more of, you know, Australia, Africa, South America, we're seeing the southern part of the Earth really well. And again, this is from the sun's perspective. This is the part of the Earth that the sun is seeing really well, which means these are the parts of the Earth that are receiving very direct sunlight. What we're not seeing very well, we're not seeing Northern Asia. We're not seeing Northern Europe very well. We're not seeing North America very well. And we're not seeing the North Pole at all. And that's because if you actually were at the North Pole on December 21st, there would be no sun. The sun would never rise. But if you were at the Southern Pole, the sun would always be up. You'll notice the sun never stops seeing Antarctica. So uh, this is the beginning of the winter solstice for the Northern Hemisphere. It's actually the beginning of summer for the Southern Hemisphere because this is the time of year where the Southern Hemisphere uh, gets really, really direct sunlight and um, the sun is up for a long period of time. It gets really high in the sky. Just again, to compare it, we can go ahead and jump six months into the future again. And remember, this is the first day of summer for the Northern Hemisphere. So this is what it's gonna look like in June. And again, if we let the earth spin, you can see that now in June, the sun is seeing North America really well. It's seeing the North Pole really well. It's gonna get a really good view of uh, Northern Asia and Northern Europe, but we can't see the South Pole. We're not seeing South America very well. And when they rotate into view, we're not gonna see Australia or South Sorry, did I say South Africa before I meant South America? We're not seeing South America really well. Uh, you can see Australia isn't getting a really great view of the sun right now. And South Africa also is not gonna have a fantastic view. So this is uh, June 21st. This is right around the first day of summer for the Northern hemisphere. It is the first day of winter. It is the winter solstice for the Southern hemisphere. So um, with the two, hemispheres have opposite seasons. And that actually has to do with the fact that Earth is tilted. And during June, the Northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun. We're getting really direct sunlight. The sun is getting really high in our sky uh, and it's really warm. And then in December, the Northern hemisphere is more tilted away from the sun. We're not getting such great views of the sun. It's not rising very high. It's not staying up for very long. So, it's no surprise that those are the colder months for us. 
And once again, that is going to be on Monday, the first day of winter for us here in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, Katie, before I move on, are there any questions I should try and answer? Uh, so clarifying question. So the Southern and Northern Hemispheres have opposite seasons? Correct. When it's summer in the Northern Hemisphere, it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere. When it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere, it's summer in the Southern Hemisphere. And the same holds true for the in-between seasons. When it is spring in the Northern Hemisphere, it is autumn in the Southern. And when it's autumn in the Northern Hemisphere, it's spring in the Southern. So they have totally opposite seasons. Thanks. Uh, and then a shout out to this comment that is, oh, that's my dog. Uh, right now, the Northern Hemisphere is getting no love. No love. Yeah. So uh, don't worry. This is actually the turning point. This is the shortest day of the year. This is as far south as the sun rises and sets. This is also when that starts to turn around. From now on, the days are going to be a little bit longer. Each day is going to be a little bit longer than the day before. The sun is going to rise and set a little bit further north. It's going to get a little bit higher in the sky. Now, at first, this process is very slow. The difference from one day to another may only be a few extra seconds of daylight. But as we get moving towards spring, the, we get more and more additional daylight each day. Um, so it starts off slow. That's why you don't notice, you know, a dramatic increase in the number of hours of sunlight that you get in like December and January, but then it starts to accelerate. It starts to pick up and we get more and more daylight. And finally spring comes, which is always very exciting for me. I love winter, but usually by the time it ends, I'm ready for it to be done. So that is on Monday, the first day of winter. I know there's snow on the ground. Doesn't mean it's winter yet. Um, but that's not the only interesting thing. There's probably, there's something you've probably been hearing about um, one way or another. There's a kind of a rare astronomical event that's going to be visible on the 21st, right after sunset. So I'm going to go ahead and set the sun a little bit farther so that we can see. There we go. So again, sunset is going to be at around uh, 4.15. This is a little slightly under an hour after that. You do want to make sure that the sun has set in order to be able to see this, um, but you don't want to wait too long after sunset because your our target for this is not that far behind the sun. And we are looking at this very bright thing here in the southwest. You'll notice it's significantly brighter than anything around it, uh, with the possible exception of the moon. And that is because, well, it's not a star. What we're looking at here is not a star. Uh, it's, I can't, I also can't say it's a planet because it's actually two planets. Um, this, what's going to appear to be one very bright object in the Southwest sky is actually two planets very, very, very close together. And in this case, it is the two gas giants, Saturn and Jupiter. Now, if I zoom in, you can st we'll start to sort of see that they, there are two objects there. Um, Jupiter is the brighter one, Saturn is the slightly fainter one. So most of the light you're gonna be seeing is from Jupiter because it is such a bright object. And uh, they are actually going to be far enough apart that the human eye can distinguish between them the problem is that Jupiter is very, very, very bright. Jupiter is actually, I think it's the fourth brightest natural object in the sky after the sun, the moon, and Venus. Um, so it's gonna sort of wash out Ju uh, Saturn a little bit. So they're gonna, they are going to, they are technically far enough apart that your eye can distinguish between them, um, but it's gonna be really hard. We call, uh, we are, we, the, ugh, wow, English. The, term that astronomers use to describe the distance between them is arc minutes. They're going to be six arc minutes apart. And what an arc minute is, um, is astronomers divide the sky into degrees. So one complete circuit of the sky is 360 degrees. When you're looking from horizon to horizon, that's going to be 180 degrees. And each degree can be divided into 60 
arc minutes. So just to give you <laughs> to give an idea then, that means that Jupiter and Saturn are going to be one tenth of a degree apart in the sky, where from horizon to horizon is 180 degrees. And the full moon is a little over, it's about two and a half degrees, just to give you an idea of scale. So this is a great uh, event. If you have binoculars or a telescope, you should definitely take them out and check out Jupiter and Saturn in the sky. They're gonna be close enough that you, if you've got a, a, with a telescope, you can see both of them at once in one field of view, which is really, really cool. You're also hopefully gonna be able to see uh, some of their moons. Jupiter has four large moons that are very easy to see through even uh, a small telescope or a good pair of binoculars. We call them the Galilean moons because Galileo was the first person to see them through a telescope. It was about 400 years ago and it was a really bad telescope. So you don't need a really good one to see these moons. And you can spot them. They're gonna look like they sort of line up around the middle of Jupiter. That's because they're orbiting Jupiter's equator. Depending on how good your, uh, your instrument is, your binoculars or your telescope, you may be able to see the largest moon of Saturn, which is called Titan. Um, it can appear as a pretty bright dot. One thing you're not gonna need a lot of magnification to see is Saturn's rings. Galileo was also able to see the rings of Saturn through his really terrible telescope. So um, it doesn't take much magnification to point those out either. And I mentioned this is a relatively rare event. We call this a conjunction. A conjunction is when two objects in the sky appear to get very close together from our view here on the Earth. And conjunctions of various sorts happen all the time. This particular conjunction between Earth and or between Jupiter and Saturn is kind of a rarer event. They were, for them to be this close together is quite rare. They were this close together back in 1623. Uh, however, they actually sort of set at the same time as the sun. So although they were this close together, nobody would have really been able to see it. So uh, they would have been lost in the glare of the sun. So the last time they were this close together and somebody would have had a chance to see it is all the way back in 1226, where they were actually even closer together than they're going to get on Monday. Only two arc minutes apart. So Go out, check out a site that nobody has been able to see since uh, the 1200s, the Middle Ages. And if you don't catch it that day, don't feel too bad about it. You're going to miss the, the tightest conjunction, the point where they're tightest together. But over the next couple of days, you can see they're still going to stay quite close together. Uh, they are going to gradually get farther and farther apart. And essentially what's happened there is that Jupiter has lapped Saturn in its uh, orbit. So I'm going to jump back to Worldwide Telescope again. And we are going to pull back. And we're going to also do to do, do we're going to bump the planet sizes up so that we can see them. So there's Jupiter, there's Saturn. And we are set or oh, I left us set for June. <laughs> Let's go back to December 21st. So here is the view from Earth looking towards Jupiter and Saturn. And you can see they are basically right next to each other. Um, but as we run time forward, let's run time forward a little bit faster. You're going to see uh, Jupiter is moving in its orbit. Earth is also moving in its orbit. So uh, Saturn is peeking out from behind Jupiter there as we get farther and farther away from that date. And then eventually, as Earth continues moving in its orbit, uh, they're both going to disappear behind the sun starting. So through you're going to be able to see both of them in the evening sky through about the beginning of January. Um, and then they're going to disappear behind the sun. They're going to start being visible in uh, the morning sky after uh, a few weeks. So I'm going to go ahead and pause that time. Katie, is there any, are there any questions I ought to answer at this point? I think I like this question. When we are looking up in the sky, how can we tell the difference between planets and stars? That is an excellent question because they look an awful lot like 
stars. Um, so one of the answers is it's going to be a little harder with Jupiter and Saturn because they're close to the horizon. When they're really close to the horizon, it can be quite hard to tell the difference. In general, the planets that you can see with your eyes, the ones that you don't need binoculars or telescopes to see, that includes Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uh, when they're close to the, they, they, they tend to be brighter. They're brighter objects than most of the stars around them. Like I said, Venus is the third brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon. Jupiter is right behind it. Uh, Mars and Saturn are also relatively bright objects. So one good giveaway is that if the object you're looking at is bright, but of course there are bright stars as well. So uh, one trick is to see if it's twinkling. If it's twinkling, if it looks like it's shimmering a little bit, it is a star. Planet light doesn't actually twinkle. And it has to do with the fact that planets are close enough to us that the object emitting the light is a disk, whereas stars are so far away from us that the object emitting the light is basically a point. The atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere, will affect that light differently, light coming from a emitted from a disc shaped object versus light coming from a point. And it's gonna make that pointed light, the light from the stars, it's gonna make it move a little bit. It makes the star look like it's shimmering, whereas planets don't. So that's the big one. Um, there's also a few other telltale ones. Like I said, Venus is stupidly bright. Jupiter is really bright. Mars looks kind of red. And for the inner planets, for Mercury, Venus, and Mars, you can actually track their movements and watch them move across the sky. So for ancient people uh, who didn't know that planets were a thing, they did know that there were weird stars that moved around. Um, it's actually where the word planet comes from. It comes from the word in Greek for wanderer. Because over time, as we've seen, Jupiter and Saturn are moving apart. Mars, Venus, Mercury, they all move around the sky because these are planets orbiting the sun. They're moving around. Whereas the background stars don't move relative to each other. So even before people knew that what a planet was, they knew that there were these objects that moved around. They looked like stars, but they moved. So over the course of a night, look for a bright object that isn't twinkling. Over the course of time, you'll notice the planets changing their positions against the background stars where the background stars don't move relative to each other. Sorry, that was a very long answer to that question. It was a very cool question though. Uh, how do the planets glow? Why do they glow when we're looking at them from Earth? That's also an excellent question because, you know, you if you've ever looked at Earth at night, look down at the Earth, it's not glowing. Um, planets don't glow. What they do is reflect sunlight. It's the same reason the moon shines. Um, it is reflecting sunlight. In fact, let me spin around to look at the moon, which I've lost track of. That's okay. That's because I moved it to a date when it hasn't risen yet. So when we look at the moon, uh, you are often only seeing part of it lit up. You'll notice there's a crescent missing here. And that's because only the side facing the sun is reflecting light. This is the daylight side of the moon that we're looking at. Um, and when you look at Jupiter and Saturn, you're seeing their daylight sides. You're seeing light from the sun travel all the way out to them, bounce off of them, and then come back to Earth. And that's one of the reasons Jupiter is so very bright. It's because it's so very big. Um, because it has a huge surface area to reflect light back at us. It's like a huge mirror. Venus is so bright because it's very, very close to us. It's very close to the sun and it's covered in clouds and clouds are better at reflecting light than dirt. So that's another reason Jupiter is so bright. It's covered in bright reflective clouds. So uh, Venus is very, very bright because of that. Jupiter is bright. Saturn's rings are made of ice, which is very reflective as well. The moon obviously is very close to us. Mercury is pretty close to us as well. And Mars uh, is pretty close. And that's why those are the planets we can see. Uranus and Neptune 
are just a little too far away for us to be able to see them with our eyes. You can see them with a telescope. But uh, the answer is that all of these objects, these things that do not glow with their own light, they're reflecting sunlight back at us. And that is why they are so bright. Uh, and I think I'll go with one more, but like a three or four part question. Uh, could you briefly recap when we can look for this conjunction? Yes. What we need to see it, if anything, and is this different depending on where you live? So we have somebody writing in from Southeast Florida, for example. Ah, so no, nope, it won't depend on where you live. Um, pretty much if you can see the sun, you will be able to see the planets and you can always see the sun. So this is on the 21st. That is when you're going to be able to see it um, as close together as they're going to get. In the days leading up to the 21st and in the days following the 21st, they are still going to be quite close together. But if you want to see them at their closest, you should look uh, to the Southwest. So a little, very close to where the sun set. The sun is setting, as we said, very close to the Southwest. Look uh, after the sun has set, but not too long after the sun has set. And you're gonna want somewhere with a clear, as clear a southwest horizon as you can get. Uh, so if you can avoid tall buildings or tall trees, that would be helpful. And it doesn't matter where you are. Look southwest after sunset on the 21st, and you will see Jupiter and Saturn hugging each other in the sky. Did I get all parts of the question? I think so. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, we are at the end of our program. Uh, so I would like to say thank you so much to Talia for taking us on that trip of, uh, as you said, maybe the sky in a few nights, um, but we I think all got to see a few different things and learn about what's going on. So at this point, I invite you to wave goodbye. Bye everybody. Thank you so much for all your observations and your questions. And I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. And as Talia said, being amazing scientists and asking those amazing questions and making wonderful observations with us. If you'd like to join for more of our virtual offerings, please visit mos.org slash mos at home to see what's going on. And if you'd like to support us in doing more of these, then please visit engage.mos.org. I also included the links down at the bottom of the programs that Talia was using today. So we have uh, Worldwide Telescope and Stellarium, which you can uh, also just search in your favorite search engine and visit and check them out yourself. Have a great one, everyone. Thanks.